So uh, for today's workshop, I would like to shortly introduce our bibliographical data working group. It is a quite new group, which is uh, which was founded in 2019. So we are already uh, in the first year of our existence. And this uh, working group is chaired by uh, Tomasz Umerle from uh, Institute uh, for Literary Research of Polish Academy of Sciences, who is unfortunately ill today and can't be uh, here today with us. Uh, all together, uh, we have uh, right now more than 30 members from 15 European countries and the main uh, activity or the main goal of uh, our working group is to establish a platform for mutual discussion between the, all of the types of different bibliographical data stakeholders, that mean bibliographical data curators, researchers and IT developers. Uh, one of our or our main output for uh, this year should be uh, bibliographical data uh, landscape analysis report, which should be some, uh, let's say, kick of text or some uh, basic summary of our current overview of European uh, bibliographical data landscape. And uh, we are nearing to the end. We do hope that we would be able to finish it uh, during December. So we are preparing a, a nice Christmas gift for us. And uh, and uh, we do hope that during the winter or during the first half of the of the 2021, we would be able to to make this report publicly publicly available. So this is shortly to uh, bibliographical data working group and its current state and goals. And right now, I would like to uh, shortly uh, sum up today's uh, today's program. So after my speech, uh, you will be given a presentation of uh, Marcin Roszkowski. Uh, which will deal with the problems or uh, interaction between bibliodata and scholarly primitives. Uh, part of this uh, presentation would be also this uh, this poll, and we will we will decide how to arrange it either via either via Zoom or or via Google Form. Uh, and after this uh, opening presentation, uh, we have chosen four presentation because basically uh, maybe and I'm not sure if all of you, but we have. Uh, done or uh, provide uh, a pre-workshop survey when uh, we were trying to map out your expectation needs and wishes concerning uh, today's uh, today's workshop and uh, you have indicated or you have chosen or those one who has filled out the form has chosen these four presentations uh, as the most interesting so uh, we will be going uh, one uh, after one. The first one would be uh, provided by Matteo Romanello and uh, it is a presentation to uh, bibliographical data discovery. Then uh, it would be followed by a presentation of Maciej Mariel, uh, which will deal with the problem of uh, bibliographical data research. And uh, the third presentation would be a presentation of David Lindemann on, and Christian Kles uh, to uh, Bibliodata and uh, Linked Open Data. And we will be closing uh, or concluding with, uh, with a presentation of Robert Peter uh, concerning or regarding the, the AvobMAT software. It is a software for analysis and visualization of bibliographical data. So the program of today is quite dense and uh, I do hope that you will be you will be satisfied with uh, with our today's program. So uh, I wish you a nice workshop, and I will pass a word to uh, a word to Marcin, who will be who will be introducing his presentation concerning concerning uh, bibliographical data and scholarly primitives. Yes, hello everybody. I hope you can see me and hear me and let's start. So, yes, uh, my name is Marcin Roszkowski and I am assistant professor at the Faculty of Journalism, Information and Book Studies at the University of Warsaw in Poland. And I will be the host of this first part, this introductory part of our meeting. So we, we, we will have 20 minutes, uh, 10 minutes for my short presentation about how to understand Bibliodata through the scholarly primitives and 10 minutes for just short interactive poll uh, about your experiences with, uh, with the things you do with Bibliodata. So let's start, um, uh, wait a moment, okay. So in this presentation, 
uh, I would like to focus on uh, process and context-oriented perspectives on BBO data. This means that we will try to find out what do you do with BBO data and where do you place your BBO data activities within the BBO data lifecycle. Uh, we will not dwell into the concept of information representation using metadata, but we would like to use scholarly primitives as a means for seeing BBO data in different contexts. Mm. So we would like to engage you with a short discussion or interactive poll about uh, your activities or activities you perform on Biblio data and try to identify the general context of these activities. Such a perspective requires a common vocabulary that reflects basic types of activities related to Biblio data. That's why we decided to refer to the concept of uh, scholarly primitives. Mm, not only to create a shared horizon of understanding for the purpose of our workshop, but also to explore the landscape of Biblio data in digital humanities, um, which we are trying to achieve with our working group report. So in this far, first part, we will try to draw a big picture of the things we do to or with Biblio data. And then in the second part, you will have a chance to follow a particular use cases related to some other activities. So let's start with the idea of scholarly primitives and then we'll try to use it for understanding Biblio data in digital humanities. So 20 years ago, John Answort introduced the concept of scholarly primitive to refer to some basic functions um, across disciplines. So we can understand primitive in terms of the basic type of information behavior related to research process. So Answort's approach was pragmatic and technology oriented. So this means that his primitives, although generic, represent the view on research activities through the use of technology. So his seven scholarly primitives represent basic activities that take place during the research process, especially in the domain of humanities. As you can see, these are discovering, annotating, comparing, referring, sampling, illustrating, and representing. But Answort explains um, their meaning by referring to specific tools which can be used for technology-driven approach. So however, as I understand, his main idea was not to build a conceptual model of research activities in humanities, but to identify activities where technology can be applied to make them more effective and to lessen cognitive overload during the research process. So in other words, the goal was to identify activities for which we can develop, uh, for example, functional requirements for technology that can support them. For example, annotation is one of the answered primitives. So the idea of annotation is strongly related to the concept of interpretation, which is one of the basic tasks uh, that scholars in humanities perform. Having these activities identified, we can approach annotation from different perspectives and place it in different contexts. For example, we can study different modes and types of annotations, put it in different social contexts and so on. So, and then we can build on the results of our studies, requirements and workflows for technology that would support this activity. Here, uh, as an example, uh, you can see annotation as a scholarly primitive adopted, adapted to a network environment. There is a conceptual model and technical specification of web-based annotations called web annotation data model. And there is a technology built on these requirements, which for my example, I chose Pandit Annotator. So Pandit has been successfully implemented in digital humanities projects like Jacob Burkhardt archives for annotation, in this case, digital copies of, of his letters. So answered idea of scholarly primitives can be useful also for conceptualization of biblio data as an important element in the digital humanities landscape. So library and information science community develop a conceptual models representing so-called bibliographic universe and basic activities that users perform on biblio data. So these primitives refer to user tasks. 
For example, one of the most important model in the library community nowadays, library reference model, defines five core user activities, which are the basis for functional requirements for bibliographic records. Uh, these refer to activities where biblio data is a, is a middleman between user and information resources, physical or digital. So in other words, we are using BiblioData to find and identify the resources in the library catalog that we are looking for um, and to have access to their content. BiblioData can also be used for exploring collection using network of relations between bibliographic entities, like exploring the works on the same, of the same author or works on the same topic. These activities, however, generic reflects the nature of the search process and exclude all the interesting things that we do with Bibliodata beyond the library catalog. So we need a more comprehensive perspective on Bibliodata activities rooted in a digital scholarship. So from our perspective, I mean, from our research group, what is important is the role of bibliographic data in digital scholarship. So we can approach this issue at least from two perspectives. First one is how does Bibliodata support different scholarly primitives? And the other is how to interpret Bibliodata through scholarly primitives. And the second approach we would like to offer you in, 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 this, in this introductory part of the workshop. So instead of building from scratch a set of Bibliodata primitives, we decided to test the existing one, but not necessarily dedicated directly to Bibliodata. So we would like to offer you a Tadira taxonomy as a horizon of understanding of Bibliodata activities in digital humanities. So this taxonomy was developed, sorry. So this taxonomy was developed um, for the purpose of conceptual modeling of research activities in the humanities and to support collecting information on digital humanities tools, methods, and projects. So we would like to use these activities as primitives for understanding bibliodata in digital humanities. So using the poll just in a couple of minutes, we would like you to express the activities you perform, perform on bibliodata, but referring to this vocabulary. So let's go through all of them and try to interpret them in the context of bibliodata activities. So the first one is creation. Uh, and according to Tadira, it's related to, to producing digital objects. So in the context of bibliodata, it would refer, for example, to cataloging or other forms of bibliodata construction. The second one is capture, here understood as digitization, manual or automatic. However, it also includes discovering, conversion, and data recognition. The next one is enrichment, which is related to adding information to an object. So in the context of Bibliodata, it may refer to some kind of mappings or supplementing our Bibliodata with persistent identifiers or other uh, bibliographic entities. Uh, the next two may be considered as tricky. I mean, the analysis and uh, interpretation. So Tadira defines analysis as activity of extracting any kind of information or discovering recurring phenomena. Uh, the examples here refer to structure analysis, stylistic analysis, visualization, or network analysis. Of course, this can be applied to bibliodata, but we can also extend them with, for example, bibliometric analysis or bibliographic data quality analysis. Um, interpretation is based on ascribing meaning. Here we can have three examples from Tadira uh, taxonomy, contextualizing, theorizing, and modeling. So in the context of bibliodata, it can refer to using bibliographic citations in context. Mm, so not directly. Uh, storage can be understood as archiving, preservation, organizing references, or maybe data creation elements. Uh, dissemination is related to publishing or sharing and meta activities refer not directly to bibliodata and can be understood as, for example, teaching bibliodata related topics uh, or developing bibliodata policies or being responsible for bibliodata management. So let's have these 
activities as a starting point. And uh, we would like you to express uh, your dealings with Bibliodata with, uh, with these um, activities using our poll session. And I will leave this uh, slide just uh, as a reference for you or uh, some kind of cheat sheet. And let's start the poll session. So first question, how do you describe your main activities? So as we can see, oh, we are still getting responses. So mainly as we can see, we are using Bibliodata. What is interesting is there is some uh, percentage of us quite, quite big, uh, in which we are reusing. So we are building another services or managing another services by using existing bibliographic data for our purposes. So this is quite interesting. The next question was, of course, which activities do you perform on Bibliodata? So we can see that there is a visible percentage of enrichment activities, which is quite interesting. Of course, it would be very interesting to compare uh, the activities you perform on Bibliodata with the position on this axis, are you a producer, user, or reuser? But here we can see that the enrichment analysis and, and, and construction, of course, are the top three activities we are performing. And for what purposes do you use Bibliodata? Typical for finding literature, of course, to, for research and professional purposes uh, is the top answer. Uh, we have uh, to reference, uh, of course, to build references, to compile bibliography. Uh, some of us are using for bibliometric activities, but most of us is using uh, for uh, research or professional purposes. We have uh, other purposes. I mean, seven persons dedicated this answer. So if you want to comment this, what are the other purposes? Are you using Bibliodata? It will be very interesting for us if you want to share with us what are these purposes. Uh, for what purposes do you produce bibliographic data? Uh, we have uh, one moment, one moment. I have something on the chat. Oh, yes, we have one answer. I use Bibliodata for gazetteer building. Okay, so another uh, question, for what purposes do you produce Bibliodata and to prepare bibliography and to catalog would be the obvious answer, but we have uh, some of the answers that point to build the reference for the text. And of course, we have the other answer, which is quite interesting. And if you can share this on the chat, uh, we will appreciate this. And what type of bibliodata source do you use? We have, of course, two top answers, which is the library environment, so bibliographies and library catalogs. Uh, I can see this bibliometric citation databases. And quite interesting that almost half of us is using web services, I mean, link data services as a source uh, for bibliographic data. Okay, the quite interesting uh, results are for us, especially for the question uh, number one and number two, that we can see we are not uh, only produce and use, but often we uh, posit ourselves as a reusing bibliodata. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, and I hope you can share this uh, activities you uh, put in the other category, which is quite mysterious, and share with us uh, these activities that uh, you cannot put in our, in our answers.
Uh, that's all for me. I hope you enjoyed. And uh, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and we'll try to answer this. And now I think the uh, Matteo will start and Matteo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. So let me share the screen. I'll be talking about online resources for bibliodata discovery, um, usage limitations and desiderata. Um, and the goal of my presentation uh, for today is twofold. So first, I will present and discuss some resources for the discovery of bibliographic data, which I will call bibliodata for short from now on. And I will do so by reflecting on their applicability and usefulness for research in the arts and humanities. And um, second, since what I'll present is my own perspective on the topic of discovery, I'd like to have some discussion on some of the topics I'll present and to hear your thoughts, which I think will be different from mine since we come probably from uh, different disciplines. So I have a background um, in classics um, and, and digital humanities and others from you will have different uh, disciplines of origin. Um, so in the research life cycle, discovery is that phase where we look for information, like for example, publications about a certain topic. For example, when we map a domain of research or we survey the state of the art. Um, the discovery phase plays somehow a special role as it is one phase that closes the circle. So we discover literature to fuel our research. And once our research is published, someone will discover it to produce new ideas and new research. Um, and before being relevant for information that is available digitally, discovery was already a very relevant topic in relation to uh, libraries and archives. Therefore, we find a rich literature that we should not forget um, in the field of library and information studies um, that investigates user behaviors in finding information, looks at the differences um, in behaviors uh, that are, for example, discipline related and tries to establish models for the information seeking behaviors. Um, more recently, we have seen a real change in the landscape of tools and resources that are available to scholars to support them not only in the discovery phase, but during the entire life cycle. Um, some of these tools are open source, but many are also commercial. Uh, and what we have seen is the emergence of competing ecosystems um, with different players coming up with their own tools for each of these phases. Of course, with the idea of trying to lock somehow the users within their, uh, their ecosystem and, and their platforms. Um, if you're interested in this specific aspect and also in the diversity of all these tools, I recommend you to check out the, uh, the project 101 Innovations in Scholarly Communication. And you have links in the slides when they will be available. Um, so the topic of discovery concerns both discovery interfaces and their design I think, for example, of the discovery functions provided by online library catalogs, but it concerns also discovery services, such as, for example, uh, the content recommendation services, where related articles based on a given search are, are returned to you, or they're based on existing content of a given collection. And we are all familiar with these recommendation services, I think, from services like uh, Google Scholar or Mendeley or uh, also ResearchGate. Um, and the types of resources that we use to discover bibliographic information is very diverse. And it ranges from full text repositories to digital libraries, to archives, including also web archives, to citation indexes. Um, and in, in this diagram that was part of our work in the, in the working group, um, you find a categorization of bibliodata services and resources by their function. This can be the processing service or discovery or uh, being a registry. Um, let's now dive a bit into um, one type of discovery resources and namely citation indexes. Uh, the main idea on which citation indexes rest um, is that a very common way of finding bibliographic information is to follow references contained in a publication to discover new literature. Um, and in the library and information science literature, uh, this behavior is called citation chaining. More precisely, we talk about forward citation chaining when we follow outgoing references, and we talk about backward citation chaining when we track incoming citations. So for example, I'm reading publication A, and I look at a set of publications that are cited. Uh, when it comes to the use of citation indices, however, uh, we can observe a certain divide 
that I think it's a merger between humanities and the STEM sector. Uh, in fact, on the one hand, citation indices are emerging in the sciences as tools of essential importance to manage the constantly growing volume of scholarly literature um, and also for the study of science itself. But on the other hand, humanities researchers cannot fully trust existing commercial indices and cannot use them reliably for their research. Why so? Um, mainly because of the uneven coverage of these indices in several respects. Um, uneven coverage of the disciplines that are indexed, of the languages of publication, um, of the types of publications in the humanities that are not just journal articles and not everything has a DOI, for example, as well as the types of citations that are indexed. For example, references to primary sources, which are very dear to me as a topic, are completely out of the rudder of commercial indexes. So in the last 15 years, the resources for discovery have undergone major transformations. I will not go into all these phases, but um, what we have seen is that alongside more established citation indexes like Google Scholar, Scopus, or Web of Science, over the last few years, we have seen the emergence of a new breed of services and applications that are using NLP and artificial intelligence in order to extract more information about uh, the citations they index. Uh, and in, in the next slides, uh, I will present only a couple of examples of this new breed of, of indices. Um, as, as you will see from the type of functionalities that these tools provide, they target more uh, the STEM sector than the humanities. But nevertheless, they represent some extremely interesting developments that will be very useful as well to researchers in the humanities. Um, I'm back. So the first example uh, is a tool developed by a startup called Site, uh, which provides some advanced functionalities to explore the literature through citations. Um, bibliographic references are classified by their function, um, allowing for a differentiation between, for example, references that support the thesis presented in a paper from references to publications that are given paper disputes. Um, I will just go uh, on, the, uh, on the tool itself, just to show you um, a little bit uh, the functionalities it presents in terms of browsing the references. So you have uh, one article uh, which is in focus, which is uh, this one about uh, chromosome. Of course, it's from, from the medicine, so I'm not going to uh, the actual content. Um, then you have different types of uh, citation networks or citation network with different layouts that you can change. Um, the interesting thing is that when you focus on a given publication, uh, there you, you can see, uh, you can highlight the literature that this publication is citing, and you can also hide, inverse the network and, and highlight the, the publication citing this, uh, this work. But the interesting things, thing in terms of types of citation is uh, it's here. Um, so you see the, the edges are colored um, because the tool is able to distinguish between, it tries automatically to characterize a citation and distinguishes between um, citations that are supporting the thesis in a given paper and those that are disputing it. So that's um, an interesting example. Um, and the second one is from the Semantic Scholar, which is a project funded by the Allen Institute for artificial intelligence, uh, which builds upon citation data from Microsoft Academic. Um, it is similar to Sci, um, in the sense that it proposes a typology of citations based on the reason why a given paper is cited. Uh, it can be for the results or uh, for the methodology it presents or simply as a background. So you can see it here, um, where I have these different citation types. Um, I will not go uh, more um, into the functionality of the tools, but it provides actually uh, more than this. It also has functionalities to find uh, the relevance of publications um, and quite some advanced features. Um, unfortunately, these, they are not uh, kind of specifically targeting uh, scholars in the humanities. And the last example I wanted to, to show 
It's from my own research, uh, also together with uh, Giovanni Colavizza, who is also a participant in this working group. Um, and what we have uh, tried to do was basically to develop a prototype of what uh, a citation index that especially targets researchers in the humanities uh, could look like. Um, so in this project, we um, digitized and, and did citation mining on um, the literature about history of Venice um, as a specific domain that we tackle. Um, and we built this prototype where uh, that builds again, as the examples I showed previously, on the idea of discovery by surfing this citation web, this network of citations. Um, but differently from other commercial citation indexes that are available, it includes also references to primary sources. Um, I will show it um, to you now. Um, so it, um, you, you are presented with, a, with the usual search. Here um, we look for um, Mario Felice, who is a, um, a historian um, from Venice. Uh, so the, the look and feel is quite similar to other uh, to like, for example, Google Scholar, um, you, ha you have um, an author profile uh, that gives you details about publications uh, of, of, this, uh, of Mario Felice. So here you have all the books, all the articles that he has published um, with a little timeline to show how they distribute over time. And then you have the same also for the citations. Um, so you can see um, in all the publications authored by Felice, what are the other publications that he cited? And we divide them by books, articles, and primary sources. In this case, there are no books. Uh, sorry, there are no articles, only books and primary sources. Um, the first thing you have, it's, uh, it's a timeline where you see also the, the distribution. Uh, similarly to, uh, to, this, to the to site, you can also look at the uh, outgoing references and also the incoming references. So here you have the literature cited by Infelize, uh, but you can also switch uh, and look to, uh, to the others that have cited his work. Um, and for example, uh, let's see what are the other functionalities here. Uh, we go back to the uh, publication that he is citing. Um, you find, for example, um, this publication by uh, Zorzi. Uh, so here, uh, when I, I, I click on show references, I actually get uh, the portion uh, of the text that was recognized as a citation, as a citation. And uh, in order to show you know, contextual information, you can also go and explore. So this takes you uh, to the digital library uh, where this text is available. That was also established as part of the project. And you can actually see uh, the specific page and place in the page where Zorzi was cited. And here you have the OCR and the original digitized image. Uh, so this is all, all very good and interesting, but I think what's the um, more innovative is the, uh, the navigation to the primary sources. Um, so here you have all the, the archival documents from the State Archive of Venice that Infelize has cited. And you can see already here from the number of references uh, here you have a navigation by uh, archival series. So you start from the whole archive and then you drill in uh, into the different series and then you can continue the navigation. So here we can see, for example, one specific series of the archive and then look at all the, the references where uh, this scholar has uh, cited this specific um, archival document. And there is no, um, there is no citation index that for now covers also uh, references to primary sources. Um, another feature uh, also from the, from the Venice scholar is the research dp 2s discovery. And here we, um, we played, thanks to uh, a grant by Euro Europeana, we played a bit with the idea of serendipity, which is the fact of discovering, for example, B, while looking primarily for A. So it's like stepping, stumbling on something which is relevant, even though we didn't look for it specifically. Um, and to, en to enable this type of new type, you know, more unusual type of discovery, uh, we added to, to the Venice scholar a sidebar that connects to Europeana. Uh, and it's using uh, keywords from 
the publications that we are looking at in the Venice scholar to trigger a query to the European search API and display in this uh, sidebar some resources that are relevant to a given author or a given publication that we are looking at in the Venice scholar. And this, we did it to, to experiment with new types of this code. Uh, so just to sum up, um, to wrap up this part, uh, you have some links here to uh, some of the things that I mentioned um, in, in, the, in, in this talk, uh, to the scholar index, uh, to the innovations in scholarly communication, and also to the, to the blog by Aaron Tai, who is a librarian from Singapore, who uh, blogs a lot about uh, citation indexes and also uh, about biometrics related tools. Um, some of those that I presented are covered and reviewed by him, but then in his blog, you find much more. Um, but now I also, I would be interested in hearing about your experience if you want to share it about, for example, what are your favorite tools or platforms for biblioteca discovery? Um, how do you see the opportunities and pitfalls of citation indexes for the arts and humanities? And what would be uh, your, your wish list for the discovery features coming from your specific discipline? So thank you, Matteo, once again. And I will pass the word to Maciej Mariel, who will be uh, presenting a short speech uh, called Online Resources for Bibliodata Discovery. So Maciej, please, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I think just let me. Yeah, as you can see, the, uh, the the title of the talk a bit evolved a bit um, yeah, throughout the uh, our meeting and throughout the, um, the couple of days I was working on it. Uh, but basically, the aim is to to address the same thing or maybe to approach it from a slightly different angle to to to, to locate it more in the discussions we are uh, having here today. So I'll be talking about producers uh, or something like about this interface between producing and using. It's something that was already introduced by Martin, so thank you for that. I'll just use this one, uh, give you data landscape. I, I stole it from the uh, give you data working group report, which is under uh, preparation, but just to show you how the how um, uh, how those access uh, are um, are put here. But after introduction from um, um, from Martin, I don't think we we needed so much. But basically, we're talking about the interface between producing data and using them. And we were talking a lot about how producers. Um, for instance, in the previous presentation, how producers or or um, uh, or providers can help us using this stuff. But now let's talk about uh, the other side about research or how we how we can um, how we can use this data and what we have to remember when doing that. And so first of all, uh, I will just show you some some examples and discuss them of the research using Biblio data. But basically. Whatever we do, I mean, of course, whatever we do it in research, but especially with video data, we need to um, we need to operationalize uh, the concepts we are uh, working with. And um, as Franco Marti put it, um, um, the operationalization is building a bridge from concepts to measurement. Um, uh, I pretty really like this definition, but basically, on the way from concepts to measurements, there's also this kind of reality check. So the question: if we want to to test the concept, we also need uh, we need to build the measurement, but we also need to have data to apply this measurement on. Um, so uh, for those like us who want to do research with video data, um, there is this um, uh, um, kind of good or best practice to develop this bibliographical consciousness, as Catherine Boat uh, writes. So basically. To uh, to provide um, to, to 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 be aware of the construction of our data, and so we can account for phenomena which are indeed graspable by data sets. So basically, we have to know the data set, how it was constructed, how uh, what methodology is behind it, in order to uh, to produce any claims. But let's not talk so much theoretically about it, and let's move to the uh, to the actual examples. And I will just walk you through. Um, through the research I, I conducted some time ago, still waiting for the article to be published. Hopefully this year it will um, it will emerge uh, from uh, from the darkness. But uh, um, so far um, I'll just uh, just uh, just give you a brief introduction, looking at what kind of 
uh, inferences we can draw from bibliographical data and what are the dangers and pitfalls are awaiting us and why we have to be aware of them. So I was working on the customized, and I'm currently still working on it, a customized data set from Polish literary bibliography. So we can see the range is 89,002. And there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of works, reception pieces, so articles, reviews, about uh, more than 2,000 writers, lots of journals, lots of publishers. So it's a really big data set. And my main research question was to see how the process of uh, transformation in Poland worked um, uh, on the example of bibliographical data. So I'm just looking from how the landscape of literature, so it's literary life, has changed from 89 to 2002. And my main assumption working with some hypothesis was that we're going coming from big concentration of literary life um, uh, towards kind of deconcentration and then uh, reconcentration in the capitalist uh, free markets. So that's the, uh, the main assumption to put it in general terms. So what we can do with this data? So this is one of the examples of, of, the, uh, of, the, um, um, of the outcomes we can generate with the, uh, uh, from this uh, data. So basically, um, this is the screen of average number of books, articles published by, by publishers and journals. So the big screen uh, shows you um, so the number of average number of publications and the small screen, the number of players, so active publishers or journals. And you can see the stuff, stuff I was talking about. So basically that we, uh, uh, we start with big uh, publishers and, uh, and uh, publishing a lot to so the market is concentrated. It gets deconcentrated. So, so less activity from the big ones. And yet again, uh, especially in terms of big publishers, we can see the lot of big production starting from uh, mid 90s is going on and everything looks looks cool and uh, nice but then we just start to think wh uh, whether um, uh, this this data really represents the issue in question so one thing about our data sets and one thing why i started in 1989 not in 1988 is that for instance we had to get rid of 1988 data because they were um, they were created with a bit different method so they for instance they they would have more journals, which are later discontinued. So that would affect our results. So if I didn't know that, I would start in 88, which will kind of change the, uh, the, the landscape I'm showing here. Another thing worth mentioning is that the definition of a book, so, and we're, we'll be talking about uh, a bit more in a second, but, uh, but still for scholars, the book or literature, some of those concepts are, could be quite elusive. You don't have to, you don't have to, uh, define them too well for bibliographers they have to be pretty well defined so they can include something in the database or not so the concept of uh, what is a book and who's a publisher is crucial here so we have lots of small publishers but it's also because uh, of the fact that um, there's a big uh, production of small uh, book of verses in Poland. So basically lots of poets publishing small uh, pieces. So every institution publishing this would be counted as a publisher. So that's why we have lots of those small publishers, but indeed sometimes it's like just this cultural institution which published just only this one piece, but it's mentioned as this publisher. So when interpreting the data, you just have to know this stuff so you know what actually is going on here and what this um, picture describes. But let's move further. So here we can see the uh, something we can call evolution of literary um, field. So basically, um, this is the the number, as you can see, of literary journal pieces published, active literary authors, literary books published, number of active literary publishers, and active literary uh, journals. So we can see lots of um, uh, lots of numbers here. There's a more or less growth everywhere. Uh, but again, here we have to ask who's the publisher? Is this uh, this relevant for our uh, research? But also who's the author? So this is also like an important distinction in terms of um, of literary bibliodata. That, uh, for instance, in in the published Polish literary bibliography, um, some authors who are uh, considered great authors are um, covered more uh, more um, in, in more detail. So the old mentions of them are are collected. In some cases, they are not. And also, if you if you are an early author, you may not be considered. Um, uh, kind of 
worthwhile to be included. I mean, maybe not now, but uh, in the recent times, as the methodology has changed uh, slightly. So um, uh, again, so so we have many types of those authors. So in, when talking about um, the, the number of those active authors, we have to remember about this, especially also in, in terms of, of, of uh, mm, uh, pieces that may be made mentioned uh, uh, then. So uh, one thing I just wanted to show here before we move to authors in more detail is that we see there are some spikes here in the number of coverage. And also sometimes they correspond with, uh, with the shift in methodology. So and not getting into detail here, again, sometimes the fact that there's more literary journal articles is not because there are more articles, but that the methodology included some uh, journals which were not previously um, evaluated. So we have to be really, really focused and clear about what what we want to work with. Um, and uh, my last example with with those with two 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 um, the screens would be would consider um, the critical reception of authors. As I mentioned, they they get a bit different coverage. And here you can see with the blue line the number or like the percentage of critical attention based on how many reviews they received. So in the blue lines, they are like the group of masters, so like 11 great Polish authors. And uh, in red, we have the coverage that, uh, um, uh, that new authors uh, get. And of course, we can see that uh, uh, somehow the, um, uh, the, there's a big larger average for um, for those masters. However, if we look in more depth, so for instance, we have big spike in 1996 when uh, Wisława Szymborska got uh, the Nobel Prize. Um, we had some uh, some um, spikes before the fall here when one of the authors died here. Also, there was a death of one of them. So they get more attention. So again, if we look at those data without this context, without knowing um, uh, uh, how the system or how the methodology works, we we don't we are not able to, to draw particular uh, particular conclusions. And perhaps, yeah, so this is the uh, uh, a different view on this, like plotted the critical attention uh, to the authors, to the debuting authors and to the, the, the established ones. So there's a huge difference in reception, partly due to the methodology which favors the, uh, the big ones, the known ones. Um, so, okay, so I'm slowly running out of time. So I'll basically uh, end up with this here with this one, uh, which kind of shows, kind of confirms the hypothesis I was uh, um, uh, uh, telling about to you today. So uh, this is the number of reviews relative to the publisher side. So we can see that uh, um, in blue that uh, the, the big publishers get more uh, attention in the beginning, we, we had smaller, we can kind of the concentration of the market and then a the reconcentration where big publishers kind of occupy the space of the literary attention and everything works fine as long as we, as we are aware whether those changes are really uh, because of the fact that more of their books were covered or rather uh, because um, because there was a change in methodology of data collection, for instance, which could be sometimes could be the case. So I put together those challenges we need to think about uh, um, when working with uh, doing research with video data. Just in some groups I mentioned today. So first of all, methodological consistency over time, and especially it's important for such big long-term projects like Polish literary bibliography, which. Uh, um, which takes back started in in the 50s, so that's uh, that's a lot of time to to, to do some methodological changes. Um, definition. So as, as mentioned, so what is literature? Who is an author? What is the literary book? All those things we have to know about the data set if we want to work with it, and the level of detail. So again, some um, authors or some event issues could get more coverage than others, which means that basically they get more coverage, not that they're for instance, less important, something like that. So thank you, Maciej, once again, and thank you very much. And I will pass the word to uh, David, who will help the presentation on uh, Bibliodata Lodification. Uh, David and Christian uh, are uh, participants or uh, uh, researchers uh, active in the LexBib project. And uh, with David, you will have uh, an advantage that David has pre-recorded his speech, so you can pose the question via chat to him immediately, and he would be probably uh, able to answer to answer in real time. So David and Christian, floor is yours.
Yes, thank you, Wojtek. Um, we have pre-recorded this, beca this because it's two of us and uh, I will just press play and then please place your uh, questions in the chat. Hello, I'm David. I'm presenting this together with Christiane Klaas from Universität Hildesheim. We are talking about ongoing work in the LexBIP project, a project that has been started at Universität Hildesheim and is now endorsed by the Alexis European Research Infrastructure Project. The goal of the LexBIP project is the creation of a digital bibliography platform of lexicography and dictionary research where items are instances of domain ontology classes. Items may be publications with their structured publication, metadata and content describing metadata, persons, organizations, projects, events and places and all these items are then linked using properties defined in a domain ontology. We are interested in bibliodata workflows such as structuring of plain text bibliographies and the conversion of literal values in bibliographies to linked data. We are using DARIA Working Group Bibliodata as platform for making our workflows transparent and collaboratively develop best practices. What we see here is the scenario where we want to get to. This is a bibliographic item which is linked to its creators, which are natural persons that participate in an institute and in some projects. And uh, this item has been presented at a conference and has a subject which it is talking about. And this subject is a language resource. We already have all this information, but we have it in literal values and it is our goal to convert these values into uh, linked data so that we can represent what we know in this single knowledge graph. What we have at the moment is this Zotero collection, which is publicly accessible. And if you know Zotero, you know that from there you can export single items or groups of items in structured formats. You can search for items or synchronize this whole collection to your local Zotero instance and use it for automatic citations. In Zotero, of course, all values are literal values. For example, here we say the name of a journal. Uh, Converting this into linked data can be solved using the ISSN identifier, for example. And the same is true for languages, that if you annotate them in a code that corresponds to an ISO code, you can convert this into linked data straight away. This is not the case for most other categories, and the most tricky part is the author disambiguation, and this is what we will talk about now. What we do is to export the content of the Zotero collections to a RDF uh, using a known translator, which is built into the open source Zotero application. And we have found this workaround for making RDF statements already in Zotero. Here, for example, we make a statement about this item, which has a publisher with a Wikidata URI, and we do this using the Zotero tags. We migrate our data to a graph database and from there we export CSV sheets uh, which we use in, in the OpenRefine application for reconciliation against existing entities in Wikidata, VF and ORCID. After refinement we may feed Wikidata with the results. What we cannot do is to feed Zotero with the data we enrich or manipulate in any way in the graph database. This problem may be solved by using Wikibase instead of the RDF triple store because a plugin for Zotero is under the development that allows the synchronization with Wikidata or another Wikibase's items. Also, a synchronization with Wikidata fun uh, functions in a more seamless way if we use Wikibase instead of the RDF triple store. But what do we do with the authors then? In the RDF export out of Zotero, we 
assign an interim URI to any name literal. We don't think that we have different persons with the same name in our collection, but of course we do have a lot of different name variants for the same person. For example, we would like to join these three to one entity and then use the frequency information of the different labels for setting the preferred label. Now that's where we've been exploring state-of-the-art solutions to automate as many tasks as possible while still maintaining high data quality. Before converting author names into linked data entities, we need to clean the data, identify duplicates, get rid of errors, and so on. We also gave some thought on finding suitable linking targets first, according to certain assessment criteria, namely finding reliable and consistent data sets with a high overlap with the LexPip authors. For the time being, we chose to link to VIAF and Wikidata, but not to ORCID, mainly due to data quality issues. Now, working with OpenRefine offers some nice automated features to clean the data before turning to reconciliation. Um, making use of the clustering algorithms really helps with the occurring name variants in our data set. The clustering algorithms almost in, yeah, well, entirely rely on string matching techniques and therefore also have their limits. But among the definite merits is that they greatly decrease manual work. Even if not all the variants are grouped together and can be merged, it still gives us a good head start to get rid of the rest and manually work on the rest of the data. Now here, that's what it looks like after running the clustering algorithms. And yeah, it's ready to start for reconciliation once you have the preferred name form for every author, every individual. Now, reconciling is implemented in OpenRefine, but the reconciling service itself is provided by third parties, uh, either by Wikidata itself or by independent programmers who share their code. And the code could also be further developed uh, collaboratively, which we also try to make use of if we find some faults here and there. Now, reconciliation results are divided into automatic matches, which are the blue links, they can be verified by hovering over that, and Wikidata offers the nice feature of pulling directly the yeah, additional information, like the description for the persons, into the interface of OpenRefine. So validation doesn't even require clicking on the link. In some cases, this is still necessary, but yeah. It's a nice thing, but sadly not, uh, not accessible for VF and other data sets. But for working with Wikidata, it's fine. Now, for matches that, does not, that do not reach the, the confidence uh, threshold, the closest matches are offered as candidates. As we can see for the name variant of Sue Atkins, the true matching candidate is returned along with a few probably false ones or even duplicates in Wikidata, who knows? So this is where manual validation is unavoidable. But it's still a good way to ensure data quality while automate the process as much as possible. For people who cannot be found in Wikidata at all, OpenRefine implements the possibility to directly create a new item out of that person and push it into Wikidata, making use of the tool Quick Statements. For LexPip, we hopefully can uh, exploit that process and convert it to work with our own Wikibase, which would be a nice thing to have. Sorry. Now, the linking results for LexPip persons can be seen here. In the end, uh, for our sample data consisting of nearly 3,000 authors, 
we could make a valid match to Wikidata for about 25%, which is less than we expected, but still the precision is pretty good, at least for the automatic matches, so there's definitely room for improvement here. For VIAF, it's nearly twice as much coverage, which is very good. And even, even there can, can be room for improvement. For example, we could try to move the candidates up to automatic matches. The high precision really gives hope for uh, improving the matching code so we can reduce manual work even further on, at this place. We will also present here another tool, the Wikidata author Disambiguator, which runs on data actually present in Wikidata, or if you want, on data, in, on data present in your own Wikibase. Less than 1% of our articles are already present on Wikidata. We could upload the other 99% directly to Wikidata and run the tool on that. But we will see now an example that illustrates quite well why we'd rather try our own Wikibase. This article, for example, ex appears in the LexBib collection with a digital object identifier and also appears in Wikidata with complete metadata. And we observe that it has two authors. One is appears here with property 2093, author name string, a literal value, and the other one is already refined against this entity, which is Jörg Asmussen, the researcher, with its own metadata record. Here we see the same article in the Wikidata author disambiguator tool. We see that one of the authors is already linked data, while the other one is not. Uh, this tool offers us to try to disambiguate all in all in Christensen, and also it offers to see what information is missing in the record of Jörg Asmussen. This we see here, for example, uh, the information about one of its co-authors is missing. This is something we already know, but also this way we can approach this problem and click on this so that the author disambiguation tool offers us suggestions which other articles may be authored by Ole Norling Christensen. This is the article we already, the, uh, the art, uh, article we have seen now. And these are potential authors which already exist on Wikidata. But in this case, we will have to conclude that Ole Norling Christensen is still not recorded on Wikidata. We could also think that this author might appear with a name variant in Wikidata in the metadata of other articles so that uh, in this fuzzy match we can solve this. But we get so many suggestions that this is not very practical. And we also see that we already have several items in our own collection authored by Ole Norling Christensen. So now we are heading towards a mix of the big Wikidata and the small Wikibase for our, for our own domain. On the big Wikidata we can easily have all event metadata, for example. It is not too many events and no fear to create any duplicates. Languages are already there. Most organizations seem to be there. All places are there. But for articles and authors, we want to use our own Wikibase for creating a linked data set we can then upload to Wikidata. We are following with this uh, approach the OCLC project Passage, which is uh, something very interesting to look at. Here you see the discussed tools with uh, links to each of them. And that's all for this short presentation. We are lo looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you both once again. And uh, as a last speech, uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Robert Peter, who will hold a presentation about uh, his software for uh, analyzing of bibliographical data called Avobmat. So Robert, please, floor is yours.
Good afternoon to everyone. And before the well-deserved coffee break, I'd like to introduce a forthcoming research tool, a toolkit called Evomet, Analysis and Visualization of Bibliographic Metadata and Text, the functions of which uh, include some simple metadata enrichment. The idea of uh, this research tool, the main purpose, the objective is to perform uh, critical and interactive analysis of bibliographic metadata and text with data-driven and LMP methods in a number of languages. This is a web-based tool, so it doesn't require programming skills. As for the theoretical and methodological background, we try to combine uh, the close and distant reading approaches in an integrated uh, toolkit. The workflow is uh, the usual one in digital humanities. Of course, you can move up and down between the different phases of this uh, workflow, uh, reclean, reconfigure the different uh, parameters from each uh, analytical tool and reanalyze uh, the data that you receive. This is the Evermet uh, interface. I'd like to highlight only two uh, functions um, from the advanced search, uh, namely the fuzzy searches and the proximity searches that you can, you can set the parameters for each of them. You can upload your data sets and uh, uh, in the menu you can find uh, all the analytical tools. And you can also use a command line search uh, uh, by using the Lucene uh, query. As for the pre-processing uh, part, you can uh, configure all the analytical tools individually. Uh, here you can see, for example, how you can set up the parameters from topic modeling. You can uh, switch on and off uh, lowercase, remove numbers, remove stop words, lemmatization, uh, and remove punctua punctuations, and you can also add your own list of stop words and punctuation lists. Uh, for reasons of uh, uh, transparency and reproducibility, you can also import and export all the configuration settings at the pre-processing uh, stage. These are the metadata fields, uh, or some of them at least, that we use in uh, Evermet. Mainly we uh, uh, adopted the Zotero metadata schema, but we also added several other metadata fields that uh, were needed for uh, our research purposes. How can Avamut uh, foster critical analysis of Biblia data? For example, you can identify biases and errors in your data sets. Uh, often commercial publishers are not very proud of the errors in their databases. For example, they don't show uh, the missing values in a, a given metadata field. Avamut can automatically identify them and it helps you to uh, make more informed decisions about your own uh, research. As for the metadata enrichment, we use um, the full text for this. It uh, automatically detects the languages of the full text and the gender of the authors. To overcome problems in the code or uh, avoid gender biases, uh, you can also upload your female and male uh, dictionaries at the pre-processing phase. By default, uh, the gender analysis uh, uh, includes lists of uh, male and female names from 55 uh, countries altogether. This is just an example. In our uh, university database, we can find a poem by a Hungarian author, but it's written in Finnish. Um, as you can see on the left, but unfortunately it is recorded as, uh, the language is recorded as Hungarian. 
and we found a number of such mistakes in uh, several uh, databases. That's how you can visualize the distribution of female, male, um, and, and names um, in a given data set. The unknown author refers to the fact that uh, when the algorithm is unable to decide whether a given name is female or male, for example, think of G. Smith, we can't say whether it's uh, James or Julia. Uh, that's the interface for interactive metadata visualization where you can uh, choose uh, between five uh, different types of charts, such as uh, network, line, area, bar, or pie charts. You can choose the metadata fields that you'd like to visualize and a number of top items as well. This is an example for an author, publisher, and bookseller uh, network. You can interactively um, narrow down the scope and focus on one given author or publisher and analyze the network of uh, this uh, person. And if you click on the lines, it also shows a number of uh, uh, connections as well. It also visualizes um, <clears throat> the uh, distribution of metadata. For example, this comes from an 18th century newspaper da database where you can interactively see the distribution of news, classify ads, and other uh, items. Uh, the pie chart view where you can combine the analysis of two different metadata fields and uh, analyze the connections between them. This is a typical bar chart view. Uh, and let me very briefly talk about the content analysis uh, part. The frequently analysis, the significant text analysis helps you to identify uh, unique words in a subcorpus of a given database. After refining and selecting your subcorpus, it uh, automatically uh, identifies the most related words uh, associated with that given subset and creates a, a word cloud. But you can also see the results in the statistical table about the results and you can choose between three different meters to analyze the significant words in a given uh, subcorpus. The second frequency analysis is concerned with the text sphere. It uh, basically shows the context of a given keyword where you can set uh, the word distance uh, from that given keyword, whether you want to see the left, right, or both uh, context. Just an example, um, the keyword was Freemason, and you can see the words within one, two, or three word distance from this word in a uh, given data set without the stop words. And you can also see their, um, the most frequent words in this context as well. The, uh, the uh, keyword in context helps you to close read uh, your uh, text. You can also set the length of um, uh, the context that you'd like to see and uh, uh, analyze. The Angram viewers uh, offers the distribution of certain uh, key terms in your full text uh, uh, database uh, over time, and it visualizes uh, uh, these key terms in aggregated and normalized views. Uh, the penultimate. Um, uh, tool that I'd like to introduce is the topic modeling, uh, which uh, with the help of which you can identify hidden semantic clusters in a given uh, a data set automatically by using the LDA algorithm. You can set up the number of topics, the iterations as well, and also the hyperparameters. Um, uh, you can rerun the uh, uh, iterations again. There is an interactive stop word filtering as well, and you can see the distribution of the topics over time in aggregated and normalized views. You can also uh, examine the correlations, the topic correlations as well. And the very last tool that I'd like to mention is the named entity recognition 
in 16 different uh, languages, you can see its result in the search results and also in a simple statistical uh, spreadsheet that you can export with uh, the number of the different uh, entities such as uh, locations, persons or organizations. You can use it, for example, to enrich your metadata if you carry out a named entity recognition of the abstract or the publication titles. Uh, there is a, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that there is a poster about the workflow of Evermet uh, in the Daria online exhibition. If you're interested in the development and release of this uh, 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 toolkit, please sign up for our newsletter. You can also try a limited beta version of Evermet with the COVID-19 dataset at evermet.hu. It is used in 44 uh, countries. Thank you for your attention. I would like to uh, thank you all once again. I will try to share the screen for the for the last time, just to uh, just to show you the uh, just to show you the contact on our bibliographical data working group. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can contact either me or uh, Tomek Umerle, who is today not with us uh, as, as a chair or co and co-chair of uh, of our working group. Or if you want, you can uh, of course follow follow our Twitter account. Uh, to know what is what is going on. Okay, so that's everything from our today's uh, our today's uh, workshop. Thank you all uh, once again very much uh, for for your presentations, uh, for your presence, and the guys for their presentation. I hope you were satisfied, and maybe uh, someone in the future we can meet not as a, as a, some strange. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what on the on the screens, but with some real coffee break, we uh, within some real in person in person event. Thank you all and once again and have a nice day. Bye.